Welcome to Coronavirus The Rundown. I'm Usher Qureshi. Each day we showcase how communities are taking on coronavirus. We also break down the headlines. Today, new unemployment numbers. Three million people filed new unemployment claims this week, according to the Labor Department. Its new report says 36.5 million people have filed claims since mid-March. Some businesses are open again in Wisconsin. The state Supreme Court struck down the governor's stay-at-home order Wednesday afternoon. Many bars and restaurants welcomed back customers hours later. And then I just waited for the Tavern League to uh, send out information, and as soon as we got that, I mean, it was awesome. For the most part, owners say they're reminding customers to keep a social distance. The state rest- Restaurant Association is also putting out safety guidelines for owners that include spaced out tables and no shared condiments. Restaurants and bars in Wisconsin still have to follow local government orders. New evidence that normal speaking is enough to spread coronavirus, even when you're asymptomatic. Researchers used lasers to find out that talking for a minute put more than a thousand virus infected droplets into the air. They found the droplets can linger for 8 to 15 minutes. Researchers say their findings back up the argument for wearing masks in public. We mentioned the new unemployment numbers. When more businesses start to hire people again, workplace safety will be top of mind. Elisa Nieves shows us one company's solution. We are seeing more and more companies ask us for help reopening their offices. Kimball Parker is the CEO of the company 650. Like many, he has been watching millions of people continue to file for unemployment each week. The latest report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows another 3 million filed last week, bringing the eight-week total to nearly 37 million. These unemployment numbers have a myriad of bad consequences. Evictions, uh, unpaid debts, you know, that, that, that can really cripple uh, cripple families and, and, you know, cripple the finances of, of people for a long, long time. It's critical that businesses that can reopen safely, that they try to do so. Um, and and we want to help as much as we can with that. To help, 650 developed an online platform so called the Return is, to Work Toolset. Uh, here's the tool set. It takes employers through a questionnaire that asks things like if they're testing employees before they return to work. Have they already begun notifying employees of that potential plan? All the way down to like, you know, is your company within a multi-tenant building? You know, you know, for example, the aim is to guide businesses towards the safest way to reopen with a clear plan in place. 500 businesses around the country have already started using the tool set. The businesses we've helped range in size all the way from some big private equity companies that own hundreds of different entities. Uh, all the way down to small uh, nonprofits that help immigrants. Aside from the questionnaire, one of the most valuable features of the tool set may be the return to work policy it helps employers create. This is what an employer would, would send to their employees. Key in every policy that 650 recommends, and really for every business reopening, is that employers check with employees every day to make sure they have no COVID-19 symptoms before coming into work. In 650's tool set, employees electronically certify to that daily. If I were an, an employee, I would want to see measures like this. I would want to see systems that prevented uh, infected individuals from coming into work. And I would want to see clear policies about what to do. I'm Alicia Nieves reporting. The country has been on pause for a few months now. People are starting to feel the mental effects of staying home all the time, not being able to see the friends and family they used to. Feelings of isolation are normal, according to mental health experts. And I think initially there was a hope that this was going to be a short term I can put up with anything for three weeks kind of phenomena. I think we're more and more realizing that uh, the virus uh, has challenged us more than we thought it might. People who already had mental health problems or are in recovery may have an especially difficult experience. Dr. Ken Duckworth says it's important to understand there are billions of people around the world who are in the same situation. You're not alone. Another thing we should understand, just because we can't physically gather closely with people doesn't mean we should be completely isolated. You have to get creative. As I say to everybody, this is our first pandemic that we have never figured out how to manage this before is calling upon us to be resilient and creative. 
Seniors may not be getting that human interaction they need. One simple thing we can do is offer to pick up groceries for them. Seniors can still access some senior centers as well as religious groups. We should also be looking out for teens. During this time in their life, they're looking for acceptance and connections. They may still be able to find a way to hang out with friends in a safe way. One resource out there for all age groups is teletherapy. It's becoming more common and more accessible. The National Alliance on Mental Illness also has chapters that offer support. You can find those at nami.org slash find support. Well, people who receive Social Security benefits have started receiving their stimulus payments. People should receive their payment the same way they receive their SSI payment. Paper checks for beneficiaries will start mailing out Friday. This is for those who are considered low income, are blind or disabled, and can't work. The nation's deficit is now in the trillions of dollars, thanks in part to multiple coronavirus stimulus bills. Maya Rodriguez spoke to an economic expert who says the government is going to eventually need to get that money back, and you may not like how they do it. Unemployment in the U.S. now reaches well above 30 million people. Historic levels and desperation. We haven't gotten a paycheck in six weeks. We haven't got unemployment. What are we supposed to do? Because of that, it's hard for many to think beyond this week, let alone this year. Some are, though. So we need to have a longer-term plan. Jim Angel is a professor of finance at Georgetown University. He says plans like the Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses and the $1,200 stimulus checks many workers got may seem like free money to those getting the help. But it's not. This is an election year. And with a closely fought battle coming our way, it's no surprise that the politicians are saying, let's give everybody free money. The question is, who's going to pay for this? He has an answer, but you may not like it. You know, when the government gives you money, it's nothing more than a temporary loan. Don't let anybody kid you. You know, what the government gives you with one hand, they take with the other. Congress is now looking at a potential fifth coronavirus-related stimulus package. The latest one from the House would be worth around $3 trillion, much larger than the previous bills like the $2 trillion CARES Act. Eventually, all that stimulus money will need to be made up somewhere down the line. That could come in the form of deep spending cuts on federal programs like food stamps or Medicaid and the potential for raising taxes in the coming years. Yeah, we're all going to pay for all the money that's being spent right now. It's just a question of who, what, when, where, and how. Questions temporarily on hold amid today's widespread financial pain. In Washington, I'm Maya Rodriguez reporting. Scientists are learning more about how coronavirus attacks the body, the growing list of impacts, and what it means for the odd symptoms some people see. And a lifelong teacher helping students learn math during the pandemic. Fractions are your friend. Meet Mrs. Spencer and learn why she's so passionate about teaching. From a U.S. warehouse. Businesses now have more time to return their rescue loans to the government if they want without a penalty. The Treasury Department and Small Business Administration extended the deadline to May 18th. The change will mostly affect larger businesses who got money through the program early on, though some smaller businesses have also decided to return the loan money. Well, a Virginia woman is helping students learn math right now, but she's not what you might expect from a tutor. Zach Dahlheimer introduces us to Mrs. Spencer. Good evening. Welcome to Mrs. Spencer's math lab. This is my joy. You can be successful. Throughout her life, Dolores Spencer has been teaching. One of my teachers one year was out for six, six weeks after surgery, and I taught the class because the substitute said that she didn't know how to teach algebra, and the class voted me to be the teacher. She became a math teacher back in 1956. After years in the classroom, she does private tutoring. Now at 88 years old, for her, age is just a number. I tell people it's GG and G, God, genes, 
and good living. She wanted to help families during the COVID-19 pandemic. Parents are homeschooling their children in mathematics. She and her godson brought her classroom to Facebook Live. The only question that's wrong is the one that you didn't ask. Tutoring every Tuesday night from her Hampton home. Fractions are your friends. Not for pay, but for passion. By two topics that students have come to me about that they're having difficulty with. Three-fifths, that's how we read it. She breaks it down into small, intelligible pieces. We have people from Los Angeles all throughout the country who are saying, we need this. To sum it up. At 100, we'll, we will consider, consider, seriously consider retirement. Spencer doesn't intend on slowing down anytime soon. I'll just do it as long as I can. Researchers are now finding that coronavirus can also affect several organs like the heart, liver, brain, kidneys, and intestines. Medical experts say new findings may help explain some other symptoms that have been seen in patients like blood clots, headaches, and kidney failure. It's rare, but there are increasing numbers of children experiencing a dangerous inflammatory syndrome li likely linked to coronavirus. More than 100 possible cases have shown up in the New York City area of what they are calling pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome. At least two young boys and an 18-year-old girl died. Cases are appearing in other U.S. cities and in Europe. The symptoms are similar to another condition uh, known as Kawasaki disease that is triggered by infections. And this happens to a lot of viruses that they can trigger these type of inflammatory syndromes. And with COVID-19, we've been seeing it in adults um, in the you know shape of a cytokine storm. So this is the first time we're seeing these inflammatory uh, syndromes in children. The COVID-related inflammatory syndrome can affect multiple organs. Symptoms are high, long-lasting fever, rashes, swelling of palms, feet, swollen lymph nodes, and red eyes. Doctors think it could be a delayed complication of COVID-19. A majority of children, you know, one, don't develop this post-inflammatory syndrome. And then those who do uh, develop this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, a majority actually recover fully. Early treatment is best, so if a child has inflammatory symptoms, it's best to see a doctor right away. Many of these children are getting something called uh, intravenous immunoglobulin, so it's infusion of antibodies that help them fight off um, this inflammatory syndrome. Some kids need steroids, um, some need aspirin. Doctors also say children appear to be recovering better than adults from this syndrome, and it's not contagious like the virus. With record unemployment levels, more people are now using side hustles to earn extra income. As Kai Beach reports, experts think it could become the new norm. I felt like there was a, a much larger need with everybody being at home for three months or whatever. With coronavirus concerns putting the brakes on business, Spencer Scott is shifting gears. I actually have to tune this. And creating a new way to make money. Already I've tuned two or three people's bikes from Facebook and three or four people from around the neighborhood. This environmental scientist is now supplementing his household income by doing bike repairs in his garage on the weekends. After his wife's work hours were slashed. She's a nurse at an asthma and allergy clinic. And she was cut back to two days a week, so I felt like... Just a little extra side cash would, would be nice. With the tools and technique, Scott has turned his side hustle into a much larger role. Something economic experts say more people are now doing during this pandemic. It's kind of like diversifying your investment portfolio. Dr. Christina Huber is an economics professor at Metropolitan State University of Denver. With tens of millions of Americans unemployed, she says having a supplemental income is becoming more important in this uncertain economy. I think this economic downturn is going to last for a long time. Things aren't going to get back to normal for a while. So the people that can find the side hustles um, maybe will be a step ahead of the game. <laughs> For Scott, his side hustle is providing more than money. It's helped financially a little bit, and it's definitely helped with the psyche. It's giving his family financial flexibility, peace of mind, and perhaps a new future. If it keeps going, we'll see after all this craziness is over if I can still keep selling and, and working on them. I'd love to. I'm Kai Beach reporting. The isolation of the pandemic is on display in a powerful way. How this art exhibit is connecting people around the world.
Welcome back. With museums everywhere closed, some artists are displaying their work virtually. A new online exhibition gathers artists' self-portraits in a time of coronavirus. The works bring together art from around the world, tapping into a central theme inspired by the pandemic. Photographs, sketches, paintings, even sculptures. These are the self-portraits of artists responding to COVID-19. I've always loved self-portraits. You know, it's so deeply personal. And, you know, with artists, it's, it's like we take all of this frustration and this fear, all of this, and you can put that into your art. With Ursuline College's Wasmer Gallery closed, administrators reached out to artists to create the exhibition. Their muse, the isolation of the pandemic. You know, you look into people's eyes and you can feel what they feel, or maybe that, that's something that you're feeling as well, and you can relate to that. 100 images, 72 artists sharing their works on the gallery's Flickr page. We're all fighting the same battle. One of those artists is Cleveland-based flight attendant Unita Walker, her self-portrait entitled Caged Bird. I called it Caged Bird because uh, that's kind of how I feel right now. Like I... I feel like I belong in the skies, and that's kind of been my, my passion. The digital art show was open to all professional and emerging artists to capture their self-portraits and feelings about the pandemic through self-reflective artwork. For Walker, it was a way to connect to a global community of artists and observers. I personally hope that people are comforted that they aren't alone in this fight, that it's an unusual circumstance that we're in, but we still can find creative ways to to come together. We're connecting with people and our, the, maybe they're friends, maybe they're people who live right next door, but you really can't, you can't embrace them, but the, in a way you can embrace them through the artwork. It's an embrace, she says, already resonating with thousands. A veteran who just turned 100 had a pretty memorable birthday. Bill Cheeseman is a World War II veteran who lives in Sarasota, Florida. His family couldn't come to town to celebrate because of the pandemic. Local veterans found out and decided to honor Bill and celebrate his birthday with a drive-by party. 100 years old, that's special in itself. And then he's a World War II vet. That's even more special. So anytime we can honor these World War II vets, they're, they're real heroes. Happy birthday! Bill's family says they hold a big party for him every year, so the gesture was extra special since this birthday was a major milestone. Well, foster children nationwide can't see their biological parents right now. The team that's dedicating its time to sewing the masks next. Welcome back. We like to end the rundown with stories that remind us of the good going on all around us. A group of seamstresses in Ohio are trying to spread positivity to foster children. They call themselves the Rosie Riveters of the New Age. They found out that 1,800 foster children in their area cannot visit their biological parents during this time. So they decided to start sewing fun face masks just for these kids. We say a prayer for the children that we're sewing for and you know wish them well and hope that they you know their life can you know keep going on the right direction the group has already delivered masks to most of the children they've still got about 100 more to make well that's all the time we have today for coronavirus the rundown we'll see you next time i'm usher Qureshi. thank you for joining us